Paradox and that uh, it is my group as we will talk here today in this very important meeting. So first, I think in my talk I have like two different sections. So I will first tell you a bit about our work with human reproductive stem cells and how we have been differentiating those to us in our stem cells. And don't worry, in the end I will get to the unreal modeling as well. Of course that work is quite preliminary at the point, but uh, let's, let's discuss that anyway. So, uh, our group of research interests for several years has been uh, in past terms of efficiency. Of course, for you, I don't have to explain that very carefully, but just to summarize. So, in past terms of are the these kind of tissue-specific cells which are inhibiting the corona EPTU. And if there is some uh, functionality with these cells, it can cause in past terms of efficiency. And in the end, it can cause corona blindness. And like you know, uh, traditional corona transplantations can be used for treating stem cell deficiency. And for those patients who are suffering from bilateral uh, uh, cases, uh, autologous lymphoma transplantation is not feasible from the healthy arm. So that's why we got interested in this disease. And we were wondering, uh, since we have been working with human molecular stem cells for, for 20 years from now, so we started to wonder, would it be possible to differentiate these lymph stem cells from human polypotent stem cells, both from embryonic stem cells and then of course from IBSCs as well. So based on the knowledge that we know about the coronary development in vivo, in the end we were able to establish this kind of uh, protocol where we are able to differentiate these uh, human polypotent stem cells to our P63 positive lymph stem cell white cells. And we were doing that exactly how it's happening in vivo. So we first introduced the cells towards the surface ectoderm, less in it, and then further towards the differentiation of lymphoma stem cells. After that, we have fine-tuned the te technology and method, because either, either in the future we would like to use these cells also for clinical translation. So we developed a method so that we are able to differentiate these cells in this kind of fear free conditions, which is easier to make in the clinical production. And we tailored this method uh, with different kind of twists of growth factors and small molecular indicators. We are able to uh, differentiate uh, both uh, retinal and epithelial cells and lymphoma stem cells from human and stem cells. Uh, we have been characterizing a lot these cells when we are differentiating. It's quite reasonably short uh, differentiation protocol. In about 24 days uh, from the beginning of the differentiation, we already have this kind of enriched population of, of cells which are highly expressing B63, but they are also highly expressing other lymphoma markers like cytokinabin 14 and 15. Interestingly, when my PhD student Mary Wattulain is trying to make this kind of uh, very rigorous uh, characterization of this differentiation uh, uh, process, she noticed that around day 11 in our differentiation protocol, we have a peak of additional lymphoma stem cell marker, ABCG2. And it's only a peak, and, and there's a high expression of that, and then that marker is disappearing, and then the P63 cells are taking over our cultures. And interestingly, when we were transplanting these ABCD2 positive cells to different kind of culture conditions, this kind of enriched culture condition, what they're actually using for intestinal stem cells as well. So we found out that we are able to assist these ABCD2 positive cells they make these kind of nice colonies, and at the passage, we get this kind of enriched population, which are like 90% of the cells are expressing this ABCD2 positive uh, marker. And then uh, later on, uh, the cells further differentiate you to us to be 63 positive cells. And interestingly, also, there is this kind of additional uh, uh, lymphoma stem cell marker, uh, ATCP5, which, which is also currently used in, in clinical trials to distinguish the uh, primary lymphoma stem cells. So we wanted to know also how this marker is behaving in our differentiation protocol. And uh, we learned that it's, it's following pretty much the P63 levels in, a, in our culture. So I don't know if you are able to see, but there in day 11, uh, 10 to 11, 
we have this AAP CT2 positivity cells. Some of the cells are already expressed in the ABCD5 marker as well, but then we use the uh, ABCD2 marker when the cells are further differentiating, and then there is an increased expression of ABCD5 marker. And at the same time, we are starting to have an increased population of these P63 positive lymph stem cell like cells as well. And then further, when uh, Mary was also comparing these cells to primary human lymph stem cells, and also she made some wood healing assays, uh, and there she uh, used as a control porcine lymph stem cells. We don't have that many times access for primary human cells in, in human, but so we use a porcine model a lot in our studies as well. So we were able to demonstrate that this these three positive cells when we use this kind of uh, straps assay. So they demonstrate really nice good healing capability and actually it was much better than porcine uh, lymphos cells in, in our culture conditions. So these cells truly uh, purchase a quite nice good healing capacity in vitro as well. Um, so currently we consider that human pluripotent stem cells are really a good source of many different kinds of subpopulation of lymph stem cells because they can really, we can really have a whole development of that way in, in our vitro conditions. Of course currently we are very much interested on what of the, which of these cell populations could have the best potential in clinical application. But of course we need to understand much more carefully what are these different cells we are seeing during the different stages of the process. And towards that better understanding, we are currently collaborating uh, with Joe Sosla and we are running a single cell RNA sequencing as well as single cell ATEX sequencing technology to really have this kind of step-by-step -step understanding of this different subpopulation of cells where we get when we are differentiating the P63 positive cells. And then importantly also together with the Adam team, we are currently using this differentiation method to test uh, the, and to use that for Aniridia modeling as well. So uh, Daniel, together with Monique and uh, the other Dominic and the other uh, uh, clinical collaborators, they have been establishing uh, induced pluripotent stem cell lines from Aniridia patients. So just shortly, uh, it is possible to take uh, either a skin biopsy or blood sample uh, from from every one of us. Uh, those cells can be reprogrammed with this called Yamanaka factors to behave like embryonic stem cells. And this technology was established over 10 years already, and this technology is used a lot already for different kind of disease modeling purposes. Because in this way we have, can have a disease on, on this, and this we can use for this uh, disease modeling. Of course, very importantly, an important part of the work is to fully characterize the induced pluripotent stem cells which have been generated, which have been reprogrammed, so that their quality is good, so that the, uh, the, any problems with the quality doesn't compromise the results we are getting in this cell, cell line, because the quality is important in cell modeling as well. So importantly, this kind of uh, very crucial characterization of these stem cell lines were conducted already in, in France, and then we got these cell lines in, in our laboratory to test those for lymph stem cell differentiation. And interestingly, we were finally able to capture these cell lines in our lab, and we were able to start to test our differentiation method with these Aniridia specific IPSC lines. And we notice they're exactly the same trend we can see with healthy IPS cells as well. So the cells are expressing ABCT2 marker in day 10, and then further when we differentiate them uh, towards the day 24, we get increased expression of P63 marker. And there is no difference between healthy and unreal related IPSCs. We get the same. Uh, kind of cell, cells uh, from both of those cell lines and with all three different Aniridia cell lines we have in, in our hands. And also we can see from those uh, cell cultures and when we are differentiating the, these cells that yes there is a reduced amount of back seeks available. So we can see that both in the protein level as well as in the uh, mRNA level 
but of course there is some left and it seems that this amount is enough for universal stem cell differentiation. So we don't see in any uh, problem in the in this point in that case. The further characters, because we wanted to really have a good uh, quantitative analysis, so we used the flow cytometry analysis with this uh, one surface marker ABCD2. And there uh, with several replicates, uh, we conducted this analysis, and yes, we don't see any difference in, in the lymphoma stem cell limits commitment between the healthy and the unregulated IBS. And further, uh, Mary was conducting a kind of, kind of pretty, pretty large pool healing stress assay with these P63 positive cells, and we don't see any difference. So it seems that both the wild type healthy IPC derived as well as the unrelated uh, IPC derived lymphoma stem cells have the same kind of pool healing capacity in vitro in these conditions that we are using. So no difference there either. So definitely, uh, this kind of uh, differentiation method could be used then for future for for the for the have this kind of cells available for different kind of uh, uh, challenging uh, different kind of experiments where we, for example, challenge these cells for different kind of conditions, and maybe that way we can further learn what could be the reason behind that we are getting these nice lymphoma stem cells from the unreal cell lines as well, but then what happens, why in the end there is a lymphoma stem cell deficiency come. In our lab, we have been also very much interested on 3D bioprinting, and especially 3D bioprinting of full thickness cornea model. Uh, we have been developing different kinds of biomaterials, functional bioimages, which are needed when we are layer by layer printing the human cornea. In this technology, we can use this human brain uh, stem cell derived lymphoma stem cells to make epithelial layers. We have developed methods to differentiate corona and epithelial cells from IBSCs as well. And in these models, we can also implement stromal cells, either primary cells or stromal cells differentiated from mesenchymal stem cells. And recently, we have been also working with innervation. So hopefully in future, by using this kind of technologies, we could have a, a very nice uh, novel tool for 3D modeling of the corona tissue. And maybe this is, would be an important tool also for unreal modeling as well. So as a summary, uh, I hope I'm able to convince you that human protocol stem cells are really efficient uh, tool to get different types of lymphoma stem cell subpopulations. Of course, we need to learn to understand much better what they actually are. And it seems, at least with, at least with this uh, cell lines what we have now in our hands, that the reduced box 6 level doesn't prevent the lymphoma stem cell commitment in vitro in the healthy normal condition. And that's why we consider that this cell model is really uh, interesting for future uh, work with the Amiridia model in well. And then maybe in the future, this kind of novel technologies like 3D bioprinting provides us more efficient tool to have really this kind of tissue modeling of whole context so that, so that we can implement their epithelial stroma maybe even endothelium and, and innervation. And maybe that kind of modeling then gives us also a better understanding of different kinds of diseases and also a better understanding maybe for the unruly as well. So with this, I want to acknowledge, of course, our, our group, especially Tanya Ilmarin, who she has been working now with our technicians with unreal modeling, modeling, and then Mary Vattulan and my PhD student, who has been doing a lot of work with the lymphoma stem cell differentiation. Then, of course, our, our, all of our fantastic collaborators in our unreal uh, post-action network, especially Daniel and so as well with the, with the characterization of these cells and of course Stefan Ferrari as well because he teaches us how to uh, how to the primary human lymphoma cells which are important control for our studies and of course for all of our funding sources as well so I acknowledge you for your competence thank you Thank you very much, Eli, for this interesting presentation. Anybody has any questions? There's one over there from me, and then we'll take. Uh, 
Uh, thanks for uh, the nice talk. Um, I'm wondering if the uh, IPSC is differentiated from the Amrita patients. Do differentiate it to the LSCs. Did those LSCs um, expand and form clones, and are, are they in, in that way? Are they similar to uh, normal, uh, not, you know, normal practice? Um, Yes. We are not to request a lot of we have been doing this kind of clonality uh, assays with this, so it's always a kind of a, a clump of cells which we pass it further in the human system, so no clonality there. But of course, I mean, when the IPS cell lines have been established, so of course, there we, I mean, the, the ones who did the cell lines in, in France, so of course, there there is this kind of a pickup of clones, and then it's clone will deliver one IBS cell line. So there are like different uh, cell lines established from one donor. And then of course, uh, due to the lack of sources, resources, we have been now working just with one clone from each donor. But there are several clones available. And of course, that's one of the important things in, in when we are using IBS cells in disease modeling, that we have to understand that there can be also clone dependent variability, unfortunately. And that's also something which in general in IBS world we don't quite understand yet. So there is a donor specific variability, but there can be also clone dependent variability. And that's why it's important to have several clones, several patients. And hopefully, isogenic controls also where the mutation has been corrected. And that would be the true control, really, to then to demonstrate that we have important results. Yeah. Yeah, also, I just, just want to comment that yeah. uh, in patient, in the, the patient, there is no problem with the stem cells for years. Yeah. You know, so it's not surprising because the commitment of the low, uh, stem cell from IPS is very early stage. Yeah. But assume that you will have interaction with other cells, the immune cells, you will see a difference for sure. That's for sure. And then if we challenge these cells, uh, then we can see some uh, disease phenomena. I think that it is difficult to not die, but when you examine the children, very, very young children, less than one year old, there are some significance in the illness, which is not normal. So even if it works during your time, uh, you can see some uh, the weakness of the illness in the yeah. yeah. See that there's also already information at that young age, so then there's the hypothesis of the inflammatory cells impacting the uh, little cells could be There was another question there. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, very nice presentation. I think it's a follow-up question because it has been part of the discussion. So since you don't see, like for instance, since the sketches say a difference, would you, would you say that this is kind of due to extensive influence, such as, for instance, lymphocytes, the pro-inflammatory side, and is that planning to do, for instance, pro-cultures, or perhaps to see those lymphocytes in your IPD and stuff? Yeah, that's a good point. And yeah, well, I have to say that this good healing assay, or the results are just demonstrated, we have been doing it once now, so of course we need to repeat, but that is for the first round, we didn't see any difference. But yes, definitely, now that we have these cell, cells available, it would be really interesting to, uh, you know, study further and, you know, add different kind of challenge for these cells and then see, for example, if there is a difference in the wound healing capabilities. So, uh, we are all, I think, open for collaboration, so we are pretty much happy to discuss how we could use these cells and, and this technology further for the uh, upcoming studies. Okay. More questions from the audience? Okay, let me ask you one. Yeah. Uh, so what would be the pros and cons of using IPSCs for, uh, the, as a source of uh, therapeutic cells? Yeah, of course, the good thing with the IPS cells is that we have, can have a, like a massive amount of cells available, both for therapeutic applications and we have the healthy cells, but then also, of course, the disease modeling. Uh, but of course, the consequences are what we kind of discussed already also, that there are always these uh, things uh, we don't understand very carefully yet, 
the IBSC is in general, and we are reprogramming the old cell behavior of the young new cell. Uh, so there's a lot of things we don't still understand. And since we know that there is this kind of variability in, in disease modeling, and we have to control very carefully, you know, for example, the run the line dependent variability. So, of course, we have to understand these kind of restrictions as well before we uh, draw any too far conclusions with the experiments we are running. So, definitely there are pros and cons involved in this. Okay. Yeah, I know from experience that uh, we are doing a pathway for, with IBS uh, cells. Um, uh, it's harder. I mean, they ask for more preclinical yeah. studies um, than with regular somatic cells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So definitely, uh, when we are thinking that they are these uh, healthy cells for clinical applications, so there is a rigorous safety assess. We need to demonstrate the safety of this cell, and then, of course, we have to have a group of uh, preliminary efficacy as well before we are able to get uh, uh, robust for clinical trials. So, yeah, that's true. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, last presenter. Uh, we had to do a last minute update.